Welcome to episode five of Taking a Break with Detroit Speed. Today, we are at GearFX Driveline in Mooresville. They're the sister company of Detroit Speed, and they build all of our axle housings, center sections, and pretty much everything driveline. So we have Jeff Fuzzy Horton over here. Yes, his uh, <laughs> nickname is Fuzzy. And if you guys ever see him at an event, feel free to go up and ask him how he got it. He's always got some pretty interesting stories behind it. So um, pretty much Fuzzy, what is GearFX? What do you guys do here? Well, GearFX is a uh, driveline company that uh, was uh, started about 2005 as a CNR Racing South and mainly catered to uh, high performance racing teams, specifically NASCAR and mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of drag race stuff and some other, other things. So I need to put my big boy voice on. Yeah, apparently. talk a little louder. Yeah, so um, anyhow, uh, we were CNR Racing South up until uh, 2000 and. Uh, 18? Say 18. 18. Yeah, 2018. Um, we'd been doing some work for Detroit Speed, and the uh, opportunity came up for us to be sold, and Detroit Speed had a need, so thankfully Kyle came in and grabbed us up. Yep. And now we're starting to uh, focus a little bit more on high-performance aftermarket. We still do a lot of racing stuff. We still do the, the gear and lease programs for uh, NASCAR teams. Uh, we've got a lot of vintage stock car teams that run our stuff. We're also bringing in, uh, you know, Muncie's and T10s and uh, Tremec transmissions. Uh, yeah, just pretty much everything. Right. Yeah, we're, yeah, we've done a lot of Corvette rear gears and transmissions, even even for you know C2 and C3, but we've also done it for C5 and C6 Corvettes. Um, so we're just trying to expand our horizon a little bit and uh, use our knowledge that we've gained for 15 years of doing high performance motorsports driveline products. Yeah. So, I mean, pretty much, you know, the purchase of uh, CNR South, which is now Gear FX, like Fuzzy mentioned, um, essentially that is, uh, it's kind of like quality control for us in a sense. You know, that way we can go ahead and, you know, we know what is going on in this facility. We know how the axles are being manufactured. We know all the different processes. So we know that they're done right. And they're, you know, you guys are, 10 minutes from the shop, so they're very close. So if we ever need anything, we can bring it right over. And um, you know, these guys really do an awesome job of taking that motorsport knowledge that they have and bringing it to the street. And I know you guys are doing a ton of work, trying everything you can to make sure gears are quieter, um, so you don't have you know a nice clanky, whiny gear uh, in your street car. So you, know, you guys are doing great things over here. And I think that the expansion of you know doing everything, you know you're. I saw you were working on the Miata stuff as well. Yeah. Just anything yeah. you can to just take the motorsports knowledge, bring it to the street, and um, yeah, you guys are doing yeah, a great the, job. It's with the it. processes and procedures that we that we've learned. The little you know, we, we know we're, we're what to look for. Where things will, will tend to break in a higher horsepower mm -hmm. application. So taking in the case of the MX5 you know, Miata stuff, there's certain areas that taking an OEM. Uh, drivetrain component and trying to put more horsepower through it, there's going to be certain areas that are just inherently weak. So yeah. we try to ad address those areas and fix that before it ever goes out to the customer. Perfect. I think, are we good over there, Dan? I believe we are. We're good? Okay, so what we're going to do now, Fuzzy's going to walk around to the other side of the table and uh, we'll turn on Dan's uh, mic and his camera over there and we'll start off some questions. So if you guys have any questions about gear effects, rear gears, transmissions, um, anything you have, just go ahead and put it in the chat, let us know and we'll talk about it. And we also have a few questions loaded up here, just general uh, gear questions. So um, we'll have a lot of knowledge for you guys here today. So um, let's get to it. How's that working? Here, we're gonna get a sound, sound check, check real quick. Sound guys. check. Check one two one two sound check. Now that I'm done wrecking the laptop here, we need more cowbell. All right, we're good to go. Okay. 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 <laughs> so we got the thumbs up. We are good. So let's see. So we already discussed who is GearFX. Um, 
So Fuzzy kind of you know went into detail of who's Gear FX, how did they start, and um, the first thing we have here is let's talk about axle length measurement. You know when a customer calls in and they need a certain length axle, whether they're running our mini tubs or they're not running mini tubs, how do you determine the axle length? So what do you need to well, do? Well, so in the case of Detroit Speed, you, uh, for all for all of your housings, you have I think two two widths. You got the stock width, and then you got the mini tub width. Um, when when we started doing the housings for uh, Detroit Speed, in order to help your effects get up to speed a little bit more, um, we did a a uh, a housing sheet, uh, a custom sheet here that Alex has brought up. So that's that's in order for uh, we want the customer to fill to fill that out in order for us to make sure that we're not missing anything because you know it's a it's a fairly expensive part it's a heavy part to ship um yeah probably, you know, no guesswork involved no, either, it, yeah. right it, it's just it's a it's a it's a pain for everybody involved that if you know something's not right there um the one thing that we do need to address a little bit better is is that when the customer's filling this out they're, they're measuring most likely off an existing housing right yeah right so um if that happens to be a 10 volt or a 12 volt, the pinion is going to be in a different spot. So um, the Detroit Speed housings, um, Detroit Speed likes to have everything on a forward nine inch with a half inch offset. Right, right. And that's that's to give a little bit more room in um, the transmission tunnel area for you know three and a half inch uh, right. steel drive yeah. shaft, for more horsepower, yep. um, a little bit more room to run your exhaust, you know, mm -hmm. some different transmission options. So the Ford nine inch rear gear has a 15 16 pinion offset from the from the center of the housing there. So we want to try to scoot that to the middle to give everybody I need to add onto the sheet so so that people can put whether they want to have the yeah. offset. So we're, we're, we're having the customer tell us measure your stuff that's in there now mm -hmm. and tell us where you want things. Uh, we need to add in there that, hey, you know, do you want a little bit of offset in this? Right. It as well so that's that's something that's on me to update sooner than later yeah right yeah so if you get if you guys do have any um you know rear axle questions where you know you need one for your car you want a custom width or you're not sure what width you need um that resource is on the gear FX website if you go to the tech tab so you guys can check that out figure out what measurements they're looking for when it comes to uh purchasing an axle so Great little insight there, and thank you, Posey, for going a little more in-depth on that. One little, one little addition on that that just popped into my uh, micro brain. Sure. Go for <laughs> the, it. You know, when guys are doing when guys are doing a car, a lot of a lot of what's driving this with everybody is the look of the wheel and yes. what, what what wheels they're mm -hmm. yep. Uh, yep. Tr driving so, or using. Um, I think it, it's highly recommended for for a customer that's doing a, a build to have your wheels sorted out first. Oh yeah, and the stance you want yep. on the car and what your backspace on the wheel is, and then drive that. Yes, that's drive right. Drive that test making this. Yeah. There, uh, we've been involved in ones where it's been the opposite way, and now yes. the guy can't get the wheels he wants. Yeah, that works. Yeah, you want you know, get the wheels you want, mock them up where you need them, then take your measurement for your axle length. Yeah, get with fuzzy and he'll take care of it. Yeah, we can, and we can go wheel to wheel. So if a guy, yeah, yeah. if you got your car sitting at the stance yep. you want, and you got your wheels in there, if you give us a wheel to wheel face measurement, yep. tell us what brakes you're running. Whether you're running, a, you know, nobody's probably going to be running drum brakes, but right. but we we um, we can use three hundred thou as a thickness between the wheel face and the axle flange. Yep. For most most aftermarket rotor kits, the hat's that thick. Yep. So um, we can back everything in in from there to help help guide you on that. Yep. So, that, and that's great too, because that's what most guys should be doing. You know, yeah. Even no. in the Detroit Speed Project shop, yep. we purchase wheels like first. That's the first thing we yeah. get because we want to build the car around that. So having that option to do a wheel to wheel measurement, and then you guys just do all the math here. Okay. Yeah. It definitely, it takes a lot of stress away from the customer, and you know, then you're less prone to having an error if the measurement is off. So. I think that's perfect and it's great that you guys do that. Yep. So another question um, that's come into our chat here, this one's from Sid. He wants to know, is there a range of gear ratios that tend to make more noise than others? What causes that? Are there different lubricants you can run to bring the noise down? So essentially, yeah. 
what makes a gear noisy and what are some ways to make it less noisy? Yes. Yeah, so, well, that's, that's Two obviously, questions. yeah, that's, that's certainly a, a hot topic in the high performance aftermarket. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. with ap aftermarket Ford nine inch ring and pinions, um, you know, some of them are inherently noisier just because of it's, if it's a hunting or a non hunting ratio, but, um, gosh, I don't know how to, how to even uh, attack that. What, what, Side to come in and attack that on. Well, I mean, I think you'd help customers because you kind of know from experience what ratios are a little louder than, than some. Right. Say some yeah, guy we, picks tend have, we tend to have problems with 350. You know, yeah, okay. And within our within our NASCAR lease fleet, ring and pinion, you know, you can see see behind us there, we've got anywhere from 250 to 350 uh, Ford nine inch ring and pinions that go right. through our lease fleet. Yeah. When those get mileage out for racing purposes, they're still good. They're still good for street. So mm -hmm. if a guy, if we know a guy's really no, really sensitive on noise, yeah. we might suggest a 355 or a 364 or something okay. like that to help pull back the noise. Yep. Um, the rim, the rim surface fishing yeah. process helps uh, helps with the noise a little bit. It also helps with the break in process. Um, and then we run every street gear that we build. We run it across our dyno. And, and it's not the full break-in. We just run it up, get a little bit of temp in it, and we're, we're measuring the, the uh, decibels in the room, and we're also measuring the decibels at the back of the housing. Um, the reason we do that is so that we're, we're sure that nothing's getting out of here that sounds like a howler monkey, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah. um, and there, there are times that we, we might have to put two or three ringing pinions in there, mm -hmm. or... Um, we might have to raise or lower the pinion uh, yeah. in there right. to get to get a predictive. If a ring of pinions close, we can adjust on a little bit, right. and, and then more times than not, get it get it taken down. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, if if it doesn't, it's got to come out. Now, you know that's that's not an extra charge that we charge the customer. That's just something we do to yeah, ensure that our street gears aren't going to go out of here. Yeah, exactly. Noisy. Like I mentioned before, it's quality control. Mm -hmm. They're making sure that it's right before it leaves. Yeah. So I think that's great. And you'd mentioned the REM polishing. Yes. So you kind of want to touch on that for people that might not know what REM polishing yeah. is. And I have an image pulled up that yeah, gives yeah. you a look of the media that you use there yeah. as well. So the um, the REM isotropic surface finishing is, REM is the company that created it. Um, isotropic surface finishing, I believe the correct definition is it's a, it's a random, it's a completely random um, vibratory process. Shit, but, yeah. um, it uses a, uh, we use two solutions while we're tumbling the parts in there. Uh, one is a cut solution. The, the media that you see is a ceramic media. It has, it has no abrasive in it. Um, so it goes through a certain time of vibrating um, uh, the parts in that media. It then switches over to a polish, which gives it the high sheen. What this process does is it, it takes off the microscopic peaks of um, on, on the metal surfaces, especially the machine surfaces. It softens those up. It whittles them down. It creates more softness. It keeps refining that process until it gets down. We can get down to a you know two RA finish. Mm -hmm. we get, down, get down pretty slick. Yeah. There's a before and there after shot that is showing. So the the before ring and pinion has the um, phosphate coating on it that comes from the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, the one on the, uh, the after is obviously after the, the process is done. There's also uh, on our YouTube channel, there, there's a video that I explain the process probably probably a little bit better than I am right now. <laughs> right. But, um, and there, I mean, it's a well, it's a well documented and proven process for reducing stress risers um, helping efficiencies um, and making more dur and making a more durable part. And you know, our our charge for doing it's 125 bucks for a ring and pinion. Um, That's a piece of mind there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's if if you're if you got a, a two hundred thousand dollar car belt or a fifty thousand dollar car belt, another 125 bucks <laughs> to make sure your ring and pinions yeah. like that a little bit much more. Be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Are we answering all of Sid's questions there? I think you hit a, a oh, big number. All right, my ADD <laughs> kicks in sometimes, and I'll go off. <laughs> I ramble. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you, you mentioned that 350 gear is yeah. known yeah. to be notoriously yeah. you know, louder, so you recommend a, a higher yeah. gear. Three, three yeah, 10 is a bad one, um, too. I mean, yeah. I, off the top of my head right now, I can't remember some of the particular ones. but Is there a reason why? Have you been able to figure out 
different things in those ratios that make them louder. Um, so some of the noise is called comes from something called transmission error, which is just when when the parts are made, they're cut they're cut soft on the machine, right? Mm -hmm. And then they go to heat treat, and things move in heat treat. So yeah. so every tooth coming off the machine that might have been machined perfectly now in heat treat, it's moved a little bit. Okay. Most of the most of the aftermarket companies then go to a lapping process, and the lapping process tries to tries lap to them lap them in right. a little bit and make make that yeah. less, but it's the difference. It's the difference in the positions of everything as they're spinning. Every okay. every gear on the face of the planet makes some sort of noise, right? right? It's right. just a mechanical thing, yeah. and they're all different frequencies, and they do all um, make all kinds of different noises. So that's what like every trade speed customer calls in, thinking maybe they want to run this gear ratio. Obviously, they can run it by us and, and Buzzy and see, hey, what's going to work best? Be quiet. This is what I'm looking for, you know, and as far as gear ratio and what you want performance wise, and find that happy, happy ratio. So that actually is a great segue to another question. So we have Chad here and he wants to know on the nine inch center sections, how do you choose between yeah, the okay. S, the H and the HS series? What What is the difference between those and how do you know which is the one that you should put in your build? Right, so the our flagship build is is the N series. And that's that's basically for the most part, one of our one of our NASCAR same components as our NASCAR gears, uh, with the exception that the NASCAR gears have a Detroit locker in them, and the, uh, the our street gears we, we prefer to use the the true track. Yeah. There there's several other differentials we can do that's kind of a, a custom build, but that that N series gear right there has a, a Ford SVO nodular iron case. Um, Ford had stopped making that particular case a few years ago. We got permission to. Um, use the molds it's going to the same foundry the same machine shops machine in them so you know it's a good old ford svo case we're using the ford svo uh, pinion support daytona pinion support so it has the the larger back pinion bearing we're using our nascar 1350 uh, billet yoke um, which is what's on all of our nascar rental gears and all the nascar gears we've sold uh, we're, we're only using arpr ARP hardware. We're only using um, Timken bearings, so it's it's just it's a really top quality, nice, yeah. solid gear build. the The S series is, is a is a case that we're buying buying in from from one of our suppliers. Um, it's using a, an aluminum pinion support and and a little bit different a little bit different pinion yoke. It, it's basically to help give Detroit Speed and our customers. Uh, a little bit lower price point option if their budget they just can't get to the uh, to the N series. We offer the same options with the rem the rem polishing and the dyno break in on the S series on, on any of our Ford nine inch gears. The the HS series is the same all the same components as our N series except it has the latest Ford SVO investment cast case which I believe is about four pounds lighter. That is what all the cup teams, and I believe it's also legal in the Xfinity series as well now. It's, it's just a lighter lighter option um, of, of the N series. Uh, we've also got an oil pump option that, that we can put on here. So if you're looking for the absolute Mac Daddy lightest with all the latest and greatest as the NASCAR teams are using, it would be the HS series with an oil pump option added, added to an internal oil pump yeah, right there. Yeah. So that's the oil pump that's there? That's the internal oil pump, yeah. So what it's doing, it's it's picking up it's picking up the oil down there at the bottom out of the case. It's pushing it out through that bulkhead fitting. It then goes to a cooler, and then you you run your uh, your cooled oil back in. Um, there's a couple places teams are doing it. The the uh, vast majority of them are doing it at the back of the housing, spraying it on the top of the ring gear. Um, so that ring gear mm -hmm. gets some cold oil, cooler oil, yeah. and then it throws it up into the pinion bearing uh, cavity, cool oil up there. Um, there are a couple of uh, pinion retainer options now that, that have an oil port that's putting the cold oil, uh, the cool oil, right back at the, uh, the pinion bearings. So, yeah, as you can tell, I mean, you are right when you say the Mac Daddy, because that it is, is uh, yeah. as far as those three options you named off, this is the more expensive option. Now, if someone wanted to put this gear in a street car, is that something that you would advise as well? Or is it? This is a strictly racing part. I mean, I know no, it, it'll work. It'll work fine in, in, in a street car. It's just uh, I think the uh, 
the benefits of a pure street car, even if it's a you know really high end build. If you're not if you're not going to autocross or road race where the where the unsprung mass is is, yeah, kind, right. is kind of a a want that you need in the oil pump definitely you know a road course car yeah um you'd want that the the, the oil pump option on, on the streets probably it's going to be good when you're when you're when you're hanging out at, at good guys or someplace like that and you're you're comparing notes with the guy next to you it would be pretty good but for a street you know it's, it's probably a bit much you yeah. get that street cred yeah street cred that's right yeah so here's a really good question why do nascar teams lease their members well, you see behind me, we've got we've got 200 of them, 200 complete third members in in inventory, and then we've got just off camera here, we've got our NASCAR uh, four-speed transmissions, um, like the engines that the NASCAR teams have. Um, the driveline components are high-dollar components. You've got a lot of inventory costs and a lot of manpower costs to maintain them. Um, when you get into some of the uh, I don't know. I don't want to rate teams, but when you get to budget sizes that that don't allow you to have a full time person in, and yeah. and you know maybe have you know seventy five thousand dollars worth of inventory of transmissions and rear gears, it's a lot more economical, and it's kind of it's kind of hands off and and uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but you don't even have to worry about it, right? They sign a contract with us. It's on us to provide them the parts that are that meet the standards for yep. them not to have any issues, and they 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 don't have to worry about it. they can mm -hmm. forget about it, and go on and worry yep. about the race Let's setup yeah, exactly. and, and worry about something Car, else yeah. that they that's within their you know their exactly. control. Yeah. So that's Great. that's where it was, that's where it was dri driven from originally. You know, as as the years have progressed, the, the large cup teams uh, figured out that that they had a lot of used parts and they already had the guys there. So they started offering the same, same services. Yeah. Um, so like you said, a small team, I mean, if you, if you run this gear to track one weekend, next week, you got to pull it out, service it. Yeah. So if you're tying up one guy to make sure all that gets done. Yes. Whereas you guys, you know, they ship it's them all out on us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you take care of all of it. Yeah. So great question there and yep. a great answer as well. So now you guys know, that's why NASCAR teams lease them out. And it's not every NASCAR team, but it is a majority of them. Because, you know, like Fuzzy said, there's hundreds of them here. Uh, you Sorry. can't see them all behind you, but there's a ton. So another question here. Um, this one's from Jeff. Now, it's a little bit of a longer one. He's got to be smart with a name like that. <laughs> that yep, that is true. Jeff's, I mean, they're, uh, they're one of a kind, that's for sure. So <laughs> let's see here. So he's talking about a recent build thread for Stilo's car. Um, and he's mentioned that four nine inches are his nemesis. So he's saying it's due to gear four manufacturing or four, four gear, gear manufacturing. manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah, a little tongue tied yeah. there. But how do you combat poor quality of manufactured nine inch ring gears? Like what what do you do to make them better? What are some of the flaws that you see, and how do you combat that, and then put out a product that's superior than you know what you just off the right. somewhere else. So, you know, if you can get a hold of a Ford OE ring and pinion from, yeah. from back in the day that, you know, that's that's going to be your, your best day. Um, from what I understand, there was a lot more um, QC going on, a lot more matching the gear the gear sets and such. Um, you know, all the all the aftermarket gear ring and pinion companies um, you know, there's a certain price point that the market will withstand. Um, there's certain overhead things and all that, and that you know they're they're built for more for durability, and in my opinion, kind of, kind of to a price point. I think I think if if I asked any of the the large aftermarket ring and pinion companies and told them that I I could sell a six hundred dollar ring and pinion like the Ford SVO ring and pinions, you know they were five hundred sixty two bucks, mm. right? The, the ones that you know, we still have some of them, but the ones that we were running NASCAR, they they could afford to put more more time and effort into matching and and trying yeah. to get the trying to get the, no, the noise down on them. Right. Um, it is it is an aftermarket part. It is a mass produced part. Um, uh, we did work with uh, U.S. Gear on the, the Stealth Series gear that they have, and uh, we've been we've been getting more and more into those, and those have shown to be um, quieter than um, U.S. Gear's stand, standard ring opinion. 
So that you know, that's that's one option we've got for people. I'm kind of I feel like I'm getting off the subject a little bit here. <laughs> ring, ring me back in, Alex. Ring me back yeah. in. So what do you do here to kind of subside some right. of those so, manufacturing imperfections? And, you know, if you are to buy a you know a lower level ringing gear set, what can you do here to make it better? Okay. Now, how do you? Why Mark Stilo says that this is his nemesis. <laughs> so what do you guys do to kind of make that easier? And make um, we better. we hand deeper every <clears throat> every ring and pinion. Yeah. Um, there there's a couple areas on the ring and pinion that that I, we feel helps with that. You know, up on the uh, the long part of the tooth. We also deeper down in the edges and, and stuff. To, to that's something that we just start doing in race in race gears. It's to remove stress risers and such. But the one the other thing that it does is it makes sure that whoever's doing it. Is physically looking at every tooth. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you pull gear out of the box, you go wash it off. You set up, you set up your ring and pinion, and it might not be until you're laying the pattern or trying to do the backlash that, yeah. that you see that there's something yep. something on there. Um, the the rent process helps helps as well. And then uh, uh, again, you know, with with us uh, throwing it on the dyno and just just running it up to, to try to do it. You know, I realize the guy that's building something something in home can't can't do that. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess you know, deburring it, getting it rem finished, would be a help. Um, I think one of your other was it Sid would ask about oils as well. Um, you know, uh, we recommend running a, a seventy five one forty. Okay. We have we have seen just on with the same gear on our dyno, going from a light oil to a heavy oil helps calm a little bit of that down. It's not it's not a magic bullet, but it, it does help help calm a little bit of it down. So you want to say that one more time just so everyone can mark that down. What weight do you use? 75, 140. So there you go, 75, yeah. 140. Now what about for breaking though? Is that different? The break, the break in oil that we use is a driven break in oil. And it's a 75, 90, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. You know, the most one of the most common gear oils out there is yeah, 70, right. 70, 75, 90. Mm -hmm. You know, if the guy's living in in the UP of Michigan. <laughs> You, uh, find it. you know, you, you only got a few months a year that that 75, 140 is probably <laughs> usable before it turns into molasses. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, especially if the guy's autocrossing or, you know, heaven forbid, he's street racing or, or some <laughs> other, because that's illegal. Of course, yeah, um, that's right. No one does uh, that. No. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd put the, the 140 in there just to get the better yeah. wear properties. Yeah. So when you break in with the 75, 90, like traditionally, how long should a breaking procedure be? We recommend about about 500 miles. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you get a lot. A lot of that is is you know you're going to dump that oil out. The, the break-in process, we we've got that lined out on the back of our birth certificate. So if you, you know if you get a gear from us, you get a birth certificate for that gear. It tells um, uh, who's built the gear, what parts are in the gear, who checked off on the gear, what if you purchase the dyno, it, it lets you know right what what the dyno numbers were so and then we keep that in a uh, we keep that in a database so if you if you got problems later on you just give us a serial number we can go back and check that stuff again i've lost my train of thought well yeah and i mean you're supposed to keep me on there and that happens for you but <laughs> <laughs> what me, in the world was i supposed to be talking about to me it just seems like you guys are just handling every part of the process start to finish yeah so i mean what better service can you get than, than that you know so. exactly yeah you don't have to worry about anything I mean, you asked you about the break-in process what's that yes yeah the break you answered but huh? you, you answered well, the brass in you the break -in break -in keep rambling you know. ram you went off on a little tangent but that's not a problem at all <laughs> because you know the goal here is we yeah. want to give everyone that's in this chat room as much information as possible so the more yeah. information you can throw out there right. the better yeah. i mean these you know, webinars, we save them, we put them on YouTube. So this is something where people can go back and reference it forever. So remember So that. you'll be able to forever. go back forever and see how much of a ding dong I've been. Just maybe. We got plenty <laughs> of right. yeah. Let me go back to the breaking process though. So <laughs> so now that you've got the right oil in there and you're breaking it in, yeah. it, you know it's it um, it creates a lot of heat at the at the surface of where the where the teeth meet together. Mm -hmm. And that high, that high heat, you want to do short runs of varying speeds and let the gear completely cool down. Okay. Um, the high heat, on um, you know any any problem with high heat, it can break down the additive package in a gear. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, you want to limit the, the heat. There's go, there's going to be debris and and things created right. when you're doing this break-in process. And at about at about 500 miles or so, you're going to want to dump that oil out. It, it helps get 
all the flush it out. Yeah, flush it out and put in the oil, your 75 140 sure. oil that you want to that you want to run after that. Perfect. So I have another good question here. Um, this one is from Russ. He is in every single <laughs> webinar yeah. we do. So thank you for attending, Russ. And he actually sent me an email just before this. Um, he said he met with you. Uh, oh, let me pull up the email. I already forgot. He met with you at PRI in the Gear Effects booth, and he Russ, asked I'm you, sorry that he had to meet first. Yeah, that's rough. <laughs> so he, he asked you about the Eaton Quiet Tech ring and pinion set. Do you guys use that here? Do you recommend it? Do you have any more information about it? Hmm. That ring and pinion gear, ring and pinion gear set runs almost identical to the U.S. Gear Stealth Gear. So as far as on on manufacturing yeah. quality okay. and and the quietness really yeah. so we had a U.S. gear came down to our facility here with all kinds of ring opinions and, and we we set them up in all of, in 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 race gears yeah and we set them up you know I threaded my guys within an inch of death to <laughs> make sure that everything the rolling torques the backlash everything was set up to each of those manufacturer specs right. and as, as identical as possible. Yep. And we spent two days in our dyno cell with US gear running through all these ring opinions. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, the results pretty are pretty confident. Pretty much the same. Yeah. Oh. So, so rather than, so either you could go either way, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Now, Russ has another question. Do you use synthetic or petroleum dip oil? With the shoe track. With the true track. Yeah. With the true track. So I knew we were going to get into oil questions. Yep. <laughs> if you go to our website on our tech section, okay, there, there's a document. Um, was it specifically the true tracks? Was he asking? Yes. Okay. It is specific. Yeah. All right. So for for a very, very long time, um, Eaton's um, recommendation was to use a mineral based oil and not, and not a synthetic. Um, the, the true tracks and, and diffs. That they're like them operate off of the gears internally. They operate off friction. They they operate by by friction and by the gears spreading apart. Um. So the bias of this of, of how this happens, the slicker something is, it's going to change um, when when the buy, when when the uh, true track locks up or how mm -hmm. how it operates and. Um, this document that I'm showing you is a document from Eaton. I believe it came out last year, or maybe the year before. That that does say that that you can run um, a synthetic oil in there. So um, my my personal feeling on mineral-based oils versus synthetic-based oils when when people are discussing or debating whether to use one or the other or not. I mean. Um, is that the synthetic oils have been developed to have all kinds of better and better prop properties? Yeah. Um, if if those better, better and better and better properties change the way a particular part operates, and in this case the differential, it, it's kind of a you know which one do you want the benefits for? Do, you, do I would want the benefits of the syn synthetic oil for the gear life and efficiency yeah. and heat reduction and, and, and all that, right. even if it changes my bias and my diff a little bit. Right. So in the case of a guy that's that's autocrossing, I personally feel he might notice a difference because he's used he's used to his car corner entry and, and on how it yeah. responds right. a different way. Yep. And if you change to a vastly different oil, you're probably going to notice a different. Yep. I would argue that, that, that in the general street yeah. oper operation, I, I don't Probably think there's I, yeah. I don't think there's going to be much te right. much telling, right? right? So you know, nine times out of ten on, on the street, you know, you're coming up to a corner, you stop and you turn, <laughs> or, or you're going you, you're making a corner. It's not like you're worried about that you're not getting inside tire traction or you know something like that. So um, you don't have that track mentality, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> now, I will say that the mineral based oils tend to work work better on the break on the break in process. Yeah. I, yeah. And generally, they're uh, generally they're less expensive. So since you're going to run yeah, five hundred miles, yep. you're going to dump it. You're not you know, the expensive or the, the more expensive synthetic oil that right. you've probably chosen. Okay. So another question. This is going back to uh, when we were talking about the uh, 
the quiet tech. Mm -hmm. um, when you were referring to US gears, are you referring to the regular one or the stealth? The stealth. Gears? The stealth. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, that was a question from Jeff. You just wanted to clarify that, okay. um, just to make sure. Yeah, the, the stealth, the stealth ser series. What, what, um, what US gear did is they increased the spiral angle. So um, the the overlap and how the gears wipe in and, and how they mesh mm -hmm. is a, is a little bit better, and that's what helps helps quiet them down. Right. Okay. Um, I can go off on a little sidetrack on that between two, on tooth design. So, you know, in the go case of a, okay, in the case of a, a complete NASCAR design by you know X Track or Rave or Gleason, they're going for pure lightweight with yeah. the strength. They want all the strength. Right. Or more strength than standard, they want it to be as light as possible, and they want it to be as efficient as as, as efficient as possible. So if you imagine when the, the pinion and the uh, ring gear teeth are coming in like this, there's a bit of a wiping action as they come in and come out. Well, that sliding adds friction. Friction in racing sense isn't isn't very good. Good, yeah. However, you know the overlap and the sliding is good for reducing a little bit of uh, helping with the noise reduction. Mm -hmm. In the case of these really high end, and you know, some of these ring opinions are four thousand dollars for the ring and pinion mm. set, but they're they're worth it. They are. Yeah, yeah. They are there's a reason they're four thousand right. dollars. Right. And just to clarify, that's ring and pinion only, not just the ring and pinion. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Here's your box with two parts, in. <laughs> and they, you know, I, they must be made out of depleted uranium or something. Hey, whatever. Made out, but they work really. Sounds well. like it works. But but on the tooth design of it, they're trying to come in and push on and push off come in push on push off mm -hmm. because that's the most efficient way to do it but they are the loudest things you ever heard uh, because okay. there's that if yeah. you can imagine there's that it's a, it's almost like a ticking it's almost you just keep speeding that ticking up and it, tur it turns into a wine where something that slides in pushes off yeah. slides out right. it's going to be quiet perfect these, i like these little tangents you go on uh, my whole nice. life's one big tangent. yeah <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go back now. If nothing to, else. Uh, I'm trying to break it. Yeah. Um, when you flush out the fluid, yeah. what's the best way to do it? Do you need to like put a little bit of the new stuff in, let it drain out, and get it completely out? Does yeah, it I, wouldn't I, I would do it while it's still warm. I'd go, yeah. you know, go drive it, right. let, let it make sure everything's churned up really good and mm -hmm. it's hot. And I pull it in, and you know, by by the time you get it up on a lift or you get it up on the jack stands and it's cooled down enough to where you're not gonna melt your fingertips off, you know. Everything that you need to come out at that point. So don't do a cold. Yeah, don't do. It. Yeah, perfect. So that's an answer that from there. Um, here's one. This is we're gonna pick your brain right here. Okay. So Stanley, he has a Borg Warmer T10 and a 63 Corvette. He said it only winds in third gear. First, second, and fourth have no noise. It was rebuilt by a private party, and it only has about 400 miles on it. Aside from the wine, it shifts with no difficulty, and it was built with stock components. If it accelerates in third gear, it's not as loud. What do you think would cause that wine? Hmm. I would say there's an imperfection, most likely, most likely an imperfection on on either the counter shaft cluster on that that gear or the gear up top. If um, if They've only put in the third gear main shaft gear and didn't replace the cluster, and you got a used a used set of gears on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can cause a problem. So if you know, I he might be able to verify it. But if first, second, first and second gear and fourth gear were all used, and and the cluster shaft was used, they've all run together all right, their life. Right. Now you're putting a brand new third gear in there that's pristine. Um, there's going to be a little, you know, there's just going to be a little bit of a wear difference in there that could, that okay. could cause it. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you one one thing that I always miss pointing out that I like to point out is, you know, at Gear, Gear FX, there's four of us that have been here. Mm. You know, we've been here for more, yeah, you're than, that. Yeah, more than 12 years working yeah. together. So, you know, from 2005, when Rob Nip, the shop foreman, and, and myself were, were in here, we also have Sam Goodman now and Johnny Turner. And I don't know how we haven't killed each other, but we've been here for ever since that that time together. Yeah. Rob, um, I'm the face, right? You know. Oh, sure. I, I'm well, the face and right. trying to trying to do what I can to drive. See, I'm, right. Rob, you know. You know well, you? Like there's a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but Rob Rob Nip and Sam and Johnny, the 
those guys know their stuff. They're the guys who got their hands in it every day. I mean, I can come out here. They usually don't like me coming out here because I move stuff around. Start doing your tangents. Yeah, I mean, I can build the transmissions and and get my way through a gear and stuff like that. But those guys are really the ones to do it. And Rob Nip would be the one to call in and ask because he can quote T10 part numbers off the top of his head. Mm -hmm. And he's just one of those guys. He's He knows his stuff like that. So Perfect. he would be better to answer that than I am. I'm giving you my uh, phone number. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a phone number, wouldn't it? <laughs> it definitely would. You can go to our website, right? GearFXDriveLine.com. We got a lot of information there, but we also, phone number at the shop is 704-799-0955. There you go. And you, can, and you can subscribe to their newsletter that's also down there at the bottom. So anytime I have any new products or any new services or anything cool going on, They'll send that out to you as well. Yeah. And our YouTube channel. Yes, YouTube okay. as well. And there's an address there too. So if you want to send Fuzzy a love letter, uh, we get mail as well. Yes. Just make sure love letter is not ticking. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else we got? You think Are we burning enough time here? We, uh, All right. we, got, we got time. We have 15 right. minutes. We have we so much time. So many things we can talk about. Let's talk a little bit about uh, gear effects and Detroit Speed products together there you go. things that you do for us um so a common question that the guys get in the sales room what's the difference between a c6 and a c7 floater or before you start that you can even say what a floater is oh yeah there you go right there. floater yeah i think there were some axle questions in there too yep. as far as flanged axle floater axle and a standard yeah, axle which is, a, which is yeah. a c which i think they're referring to a c clip style yes. yeah let's yeah. let's hit that first then okay, okay. so in the case of a Ford nine inch, you can't have a C clip. Um, at least that I'm, I'm aware of. I don't know how that would work. Yeah. Um, most of most of the time on the outboard end, it's, it's what's called a Torino flange, which was from the Ford Torino. It's yep. a si- size of bearing, and it's a, it's a flanged axle where the bearing is pressed onto the axle, and then there's a clip that holds holds the axle in the housing. Do you have axles here? Um, there is one. There should be some somewhere. I can't point you in that. <laughs> okay, you talk. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, in the case of a floater axle, you have a, a snout on on the end of uh, of the housing, and a hub assembling the bearings and hub and everything go go on that right. on that snout, and that's what's supporting the weight of the car. And then right. the axle itself is just splined into the rear gear and splined on the outside and it can be slid in and out without affecting anything that has to do with um, the car being on, on the wheels and tires yeah so it's not a flange axle like your trino style would be it's just right. a straight shaft splines on both ends right in the case of the detroit speed stuff that's really that's cool it looks dangerous right here yeah that's this is a floater a floater axle yep. so it's got it's got the uh it's got the Look splines on Look at it's got the splines on the end. end. So this is the inboard end. This is a 35 spline on this particular one. And it's a 33 spline on this end um, for a Detroit Speed C6 or C7 kit. The hub pack end. The hub pack end, yep. right. Um, so in the case of the C6 and the, and the C7, um, the actual hub pack itself is, well, yeah. you know, you, you're better yeah, than this So than the C6, yeah. um, it's our most popular between the two, but it does, you know, they both have ABS capabilities. So the C6 hub pack has that pigtail on it. And of course, if you want to use your parking brake, you're going to take the GM C6 parking brake and adapt it into our kit. Um, so it, it's a good kit. Um, me, I've been able to work with both of them. Um, in my opinion, I really like the C7 kit better. Um, I think it's it's better. There's, there's less to install. There's It's easier to do. Um, the, Parking brake assembly is much more modern than the C6 version. You know, it's just not as clumsy, I'll say, in the, in the park brake, the way it works. So um, there's less steps to install the C7. Now, the problem is, obviously, there's a lot more C6 brakes available right now. Um, C7 will get there, of course. But um, to me, the C7 kit's the one to pick from. Um, but again, a lot of people have. There's a wheel speed difference, too, correct? Wheel yeah, well, sensor difference. yeah. So the way the, the ABS works, you know, the C6 has a pigtail on it with a connector, and the C7 uses more of like a, a sensor that plugs into one of our little spacer blocks that mounts to the, the spacer, the main spacer. Um, and again, if you don't want to run ABS, you don't use a sensor. We give you a plug to plug in the hole. 
Um, and same thing with parking brake. If you don't run around a parking brake, um, we give you a shim to go and place that that backing plate. So um, they're both great kits. They both sell good. Um, I think as we move on here with different brake packages that are available, C7 I would think would be the more popular kit. Um, to me, it's it's a it's a nicer, more modern assembly, especially with parking brake. That's that's kind of the biggest difference between the two. Yeah. Um, so both basically hub packs are pretty much the same, other than that ABS pigtail. So. But, so um one of the good things about a floater a floater setup versus a flange axle in a in autocross mm -hmm. racing yes. environment is that a flange axle which i'll show you here alex has found one somewhere door stopped somewhere or something it was, it was sitting on the shelf <laughs> but there. that that you can get a little bit of flex between where that where the axle is coming out and the flange the flange is here right. and but the axle is supported here on the bearing you can when you corner you can get a little bit of flex like this and what that does since your rotor's pushing back and forth it can push your brake pads back so that first time going into a corner yeah. you're going to have a little bit of a of soft pedal until you get the second you get that, second that brake knockback that you hear about that's right. not favorable <laughs> so going going yeah. to uh going to right. a uh, a floater setup will will yeah. get rid of that completely completely see now me um some of you guys know I, I did a lot of drag racing uh growing up so to me our race cars always had floaters because if you had a flange axle and the flange axle broke, you're in the wall. Bye bye wheel. Right. So the whole car is yeah. The wheel comes out of the car, you crash. No good. Floaters. If you break an axle, you, you can keep going straight. You know, I mean, the wheel's not going to fall off. So yeah. it's, it's a safety thing. Um, sure, it was a little bit heavier, um, but the cars that we ran had to be a certain weight and heavier than other car combinations. So it, it didn't matter too much for us. And the, the safety case. thing was huge because yeah. you don't want to wreck a hundred thousand dollar race car, and, you know, for a flange axle that could break. Dropping a button for you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but plus in the in the case of a Ford nine inch, pulling the axles out to change your third member through changing ratios. Yeah. You know, in the case of drag racing Except guys, if the if the weather changes a little bit or the track changes, mm -hmm. you're you're going to change ratios. Yeah. At the track, yeah. so if you've got a flanged axle, you got to involve your brakes, you got to involve all this mm -hmm. other stuff and pull those axles out. Flange or a, sorry, floater axle. You just slide the axles out. Yeah. With it. You and Kyle we went to VIR last year. You guys swapped out the center section in that car in like 30 minutes. Yeah. That was amazing. In the rain. In the rain. Hey, yep. With a hot car. Yeah. Yep. That was the most fun I've had in a long time. I bet it was. Get out from behind the laptop and go change the gear. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, Diving. the full floater definitely makes that way easier. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> before you show more examples of a flanged axle, mm -hmm. we have a question from Jeff again. So, Dan, he wants to know, will C7 front brakes fit on our spindle? He doesn't want to have a C7 floor yeah, that's true. and get stuck with a C6 front brake setup. So he can kind of That does make sense, yeah. If you're running one of our front frames or subframe with a hub pack, that does make sense because the C7 mounting is much different than the C6 caliper. So our upright, really, that we have on our subframe and other frames um, is for a C6 brake size bolt span. So, yeah, in that case, you would if you did a C7 floater and, our, say, our subframe, you wouldn't be able to have – you know the same same brace front and back so that that is a good point um so yeah, he's looking for he's trying to make an effort to have them all match and possibly use the abs with it as well that does make sense um, so <clears throat> let's do this jeff um if you'd like you can go ahead and reach out to us and we can get yeah. you in touch with dan and uh, we can kind of talk about your project a little more and, mm -hmm. and see if we have a uh, a better solution for you perfect so Fuzzy. Yeah. Flanged axle. Flanged axle. Oh, yeah. Alex, Alex happened to grab one out of a like 2000 and <laughs> this out of a Silverado, <laughs> actually. So you can see, so you obviously, like you've got you've got the flange the flange here. Yep. This isn't a, 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 a Torino style where it, it has a bearing pressed here. The the housing has needle bearings that ride right, right here. Well, the only thing, that, if you've got needle bearings right here, the only thing that's going to keep, keep all this in is the C-clips. Which are at, so that at this this oh, end of things. There you go. Yeah, that's a heavy end. There's, a, tra no. there's a transmission right there. <laughs> so a C clip go goes in this. So right you have to pull the rear right. There's a groove right there. C clip goes in. This is inside your diff, and the axle gears right here. C clip goes in, and that's what retains this this in the vehicle. Yeah. So if you ever had to, you know, change an axle, you're gonna have to take that diff cover off. There's, yep. there's just extra steps, whereas a Ford nine inch is just it's so much easier, yeah. especially if you have a 4.9 inch with a uh, floater. 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 Yeah. So speaking of 4.9 inch, 
another thing people want to know is what is a Torino flange accident? So what's the you know what's the difference between Torino flange compared to you know our, our C6 C7? What is a Torino? Well, that's that's more your conventional. I mean, it's it's a newer style. I mean, obviously GM had their older style big bearing, small yeah, bearing forward there, stuff. Yeah, all there's that. Se several bearing. The Torino is uh, kind of just kind of been the industry standard here lately. Um, doing doing that with a flange axle, so. Um, that's it's the most common. Yeah. It's, got, it's got a two and a half inch brake back spacing on it, which you know every aftermarket brake mm -hmm. manufacturer has a, has a kit to do that. It's you know it's retained out here at the end. You don't have to worry about. So essentially, it's just the industry standard, you know, axle. Right. So, right. Yeah. If if people if people are doing a particular car and they want to maintain uh, maybe the drum brake package or something that's on that, we can we can get oh, okay. one of our suppliers and get an end. That is the same as the o OE and you know, yep. there's Buick stuff and Ultra right. and GM and, all, and yeah. right. There's all kinds of yep. but it's just that the, the Torino style has mm -hmm. has been line true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. But I mean, if you're building a muscle car in 2020, I would certainly lean towards that floater design. Yeah. That's just a, a that's better. slowly thing. becoming the industry. Standard. It is I say. especially within the racing industry. And yeah. You know, guys that are building autocross and street cars. Yep. Um, plus, I mean, you can also talk about the maybe the dangers of having a uh, flanged axle compared to a floater. What happens if a flanged axle breaks? Yeah, that's kind of what we were mentioning with the racing. I think he was on the axle. Oh, was yeah, you, you were hunting for that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Check, we checked that box. We did. All right, all right. You checked yep. that box. What important? Important point. It is a very important point. So. <clears throat> This would be a quick answer. I'll go ahead and do it for you. Um, Jeff had just asked, do you guys work on different transmissions or just NASCAR? Oh, yeah. So yes, I mean, they work on T56. We don't yeah. do any automatic. Uh, no automatics. No automatics. Okay. Perfect, so there you go. Manual transmissions, any of your needs, go ahead and call GearFX. Um, so another quick question Russ has, do you make your own axles? Are they heat treated? What do you do or where do you source well, we, axles? Cur currently, we aren't at the point to where we make our own axles. We have a couple of very good suppliers that we use. And um, I believe, uh, well, I'm not gonna talk out of turn since I don't know for sure on on the uh, on the alloy that's used, but it, it's a very high quality axle from name brand companies, name brand suppliers. And do they heat treat them? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's the benefit of heat treating an axle? Strength. Well, yeah, it's strength. strength. And you need, your, your splines need to be heat treated. Yeah. I don't think the splines would last very long. No. It's soft. Yep. So another uh, question here from Scott Kramer. He wants to know, how come wave track differential didn't become popular? Are they good or are they bad? Um, I think they're better better now. I believe they went through a went yeah. through a spell there where they might have had had some issues going on, and uh, we've installed some wave tracks, and uh, none of those have come back. You know, if somebody wants a wave track, we'll put a wave track in. Mm -hmm. We're also an OS uh, Daikin dealer, which is a that's a whole that can be a whole other subject. That's a really good high end racing differential. Um, True track just seems to be the lion's share of, of, of yeah. what we do, but we can get wave tracks. Um, that's what we've installed in the C5 Corvette dips that we've done. Okay. Yeah, so Perfect. it's not a bad product. So we're going to do two more questions. Okay. I have two down here. Uh, the first one is How do you determine what ratio is in your car without taking it apart? Well, you can, it's it's kind of old school. Yeah, no, I know. But, yeah, I know. It's yeah, <laughs> but you can you can make a mark on your tire yep. and have and watch your pinion. You know, get your pinion yoke set to where you can see it's it's going to be somewhere and put a mark on it that you can see. Mm -hmm. Put a mark on your tire. Turn your tire once and count how many times your pinion yoke turns. And now it'll get you. It'll be it'll turn three and a half yeah, times. Yeah, three fifty. It's a three fifty. Right. It might it might be a three fifty five or three forty five, but it's gonna right. it's gonna get, get you in the window. It's but not it's a four eleven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. it's, it's definitely not a four eleven if it goes three and a half yeah. times. Yeah, perfect. Quick and dirty. So we're gonna end this webinar on one question regarding Fox body. We seem to always yeah. been ending all of these yeah. Fox bodies since we are getting closer to Fox body product release. So with Fox Body coming, is there a plan for Gear FX to do an 8.8 rear, or will you do an 8.8 rear? Uh, an 8.8 replacement rear, or a Ford 9-inch to go in an 8.8? .8? A 
sounds good too. I would, I would. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so the answer to the other that. question, yeah. if you guys are getting more questions about it and you're getting more requests for yeah, it, yeah. your Bex needs to get on the stick right. and come up with something for it. Yes. That's, that's the first thing to the answer. So, I mean, the Fox bodies are obviously growing in popularity and many people are building them. So what would, what is the best way for gear effects to accommodate that? Would you build an eight, eight in a Fox body? Would you swap a nine inch into it? Are there features and benefits that are great in the AD that you should keep that, or kind of what are your thoughts? Well, the the I would say that the nine inch is going to be more. Um, it's going to be beefier. more. It's yeah. It's going to be beefier. It's going to be stronger. It's my word. Um, <laughs> it's going to be. It's going to be easier to change between ratios if a person wanted to do that. Yeah, more common alien. I mean, parts, the yeah. eight eights. There's guys putting some big horsepower yeah. to eight eights on you know drag rated like, yep. stuff. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's not. It's not that it's. Not not worth doing, but um, you know you got to build that ring and pinion set in in the housing. So I think there's a little bit of a convenience there that you, that you're losing. If if you're not thinking you're ever going to change your ring and pinion ratio, you probably save the yeah. eight eight. So um, Gear FX needs to get with the engineering staff at Detroit Speed. <laughs> oh, sorry. And we need to come up. We need to come up with something and do it. If people are asking for it, we got to do it. Yeah. It's, sometimes it's easy for me to get my head. Well, that's that's stuck what's somewhere or not. Read about our, all our sales guys. You know, they anytime they get feedback from our customers or future customers, we can translate that through engineering, the fuzzy, and back and forth with the sister companies, and and make a better product and make what you want. Absolutely. Cool. So, turn mine off. All right. Okay. So pretty much, um, is this what people are seeing? What is this? What people are seeing right here? Yeah, right, right now at the moment. Seeing. We're down here. Yeah, that's what okay. people have been seeing the whole time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so thank you guys for joining us for episode five, uh, taking a break with Detroit Speed. Uh, if you guys have any questions about GearFX, Fuzzy, any of the products that they offer, uh, go on their website. It's GearFX Driveline. Um, and give them a call if you have questions, shoot them an email, subscribe to their newsletter. They're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube as well as us. So they're all over the place. And if you have any in-depth questions about your build or the products that you need, go ahead and then give them a call, shoot them an email, hit them a comment, slide into the fuzzies DMs. And uh, that's pretty much it. So thank you guys for joining and uh, we'll see you next time. And it's going to be a really good episode for 006. So stay tuned for that announcement. We'll see you guys later. <laughs>